good thing I had my wife this morning to dress me and Dennis to remind me to wear the mic so y'all could hear me and so we could record. I was uh, <clears throat> reminded of my uh, uh, advancing age this morning when putting the numbers up on the board and one of the numbers fluttered down to the floor. So what did I do? I stepped down all three steps and then bent over to pick it up so I only had to bend over this far. A few years ago, I would have just bent right over to pick it up. But uh, those days are gone, I think. Um, But we need to be thankful for those aches and pains that remind us we're still alive. Let's uh, bow our heads and go to God in prayer before we begin. Our most holy and righteous Father in heaven, we thank Thee for every blessing You've given us. We thank You for this day. We thank You for the beautiful weather. We thank You for the the rain that we're going to get shortly. And we thank You for all of the blessings of life. We thank You, dear Lord, for each other and for this time that we have to assemble in this comfortable building to study from Your Word and to worship You. We pray that our studies this morning may be profitable to all of us and that our worship will go up before you as a sweet odor of incense, wholly acceptable unto you. We pray, dear God, that you'll be with those that are sick, especially those with serious illnesses. Be with those that are grieving the loss of loved ones. We ask, dear Lord, that you'll help us to grow together in love and as a family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, Talking this morning about Jehovah's Witness doctrine... And, uh, and how to answer them. Now, uh, again, you know, a few things that uh, we want to just say up front. It's not helpful to just go in there as an adversary and a confrontationist and, you know, pick a fight with people. And Jehovah's Witnesses like to pick a fight. But they don't like it when a fight is picked with them, as I have found. Um, I get about as adversarial with them as they get with me, which is usually uh, about the time they bring their their ambassador in. Um, he gets usually pretty adversarial right off the bat because he understands that I know my scriptures a little bit. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are began long time ago probably in the early 1800s, really, they were known as the International Bible Students. And this group actually began in Germany. Um, if you, How many of you have ever read the book 30 Years of Watchtower Slave by Schnell? Or Shell? Shell was his name. It's an interesting read. Now, he is a denominationalist. and uh, But he talks about how he went through 30 years being in the Jehovah's Witness organization and finally he got out and a few of the things that he says um, I actually disagree with uh, believe it or not he's a man Uh but one of the things that that really struck him as being horrible about the Jehovah's Witness was when he was told in one Bible study that God requires Mach Schnell now in German that term Mach Schnell means slave like devotion I believe the Bible teaches that that's what God requires of us. We become slaves to God. Now, not slaves to the church, not slaves to a preacher or an organization, but slaves to God. And uh, and he took exception to this. Oh, you know, the, the Bible, the New Testament talks about our freedom in Christ. Yes, it does. Our freedom from sin, our freedom from false doctrine, our freedom to study the truth. But that does not negate the fact that we are to have a slave-like devotion to God. And so there are some things that he talks about. He is a uni- or If he's still alive, uh, which I doubt that he is, uh, he would have to be over 100 by now, I would think. But uh, he would be a universalist, believing that everybody's going to heaven just by different paths, which is what the denominations have taught for years and years. Um, But uh, some of the things he does talk about, he says the International Bible Students were an independent organization of Bible students that would gather together to study nothing but the Scriptures, to help each other out, to a better understanding of the Scriptures, to work together for the cause of Christ and, you know, in love and all of this. And he paints a beautiful rosy picture of it until Charles Tage Russell came along. Russell organized them 
into an organized religion under his tutelage. This is the way he describes it now, and I don't know... I've heard some different things, and actually our book says it a little bit differently than this. But but he, the book recognizes that Russell was really the beginning of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Um, they were over in Germany until Hitler kicked them out. Now, some people have said, well, Hitler knew what they were all about. I don't know about that because Hitler was trying to kick Christianity out of Germany. Um, he closed as many churches as he could. Uh, he couldn't close the Catholic Church down completely. It was too much in the minds and hearts of the people. And like the uh, Soviets under Lenin, they said religion is the opiate of the people. And so he realized he had to leave some of it in there. So I don't know about you know, how much Hitler knew of the uh, international Bible students as they were called at that time. But, uh, but they certainly were an insidious organization. Russell organized them into groups where they would go out and try to proselytize the neighborhoods around them and he taught them to be very confrontational in doing this. And the reason for this was so that they would be persecuted. Uh, the government, you know, people would complain about these people coming, knocking on my door and getting right in my face, trying to tell me I'm going to hell. And so then the authorities would come in and start hassling them. Well, this would cause other people to see them coming down the street and a police car behind them, open their door, come in, come in, come in, you're a persecuted Christian. And they fostered this kind of a, uh, a feeling toward them by acting the way that they did. And they, they perfected this in Germany, and then when they were kicked out, they brought it over to America. And that's what happened in America. And, and uh, Schnell, or Shell talks about how they were actually trained in doing this technique to gain people's affection and to look like they were being persecuted by the authorities so that people would be kindly toward them and they would have greater opportunities to get into homes and teach their, their doctrine. Um, and then, of course, he, he talks about all these other things that happened and, and how that Russell took them off in a direction that wasn't according to scriptures. Uh, and uh, then uh, after Russell died, um, the book says who was next. Anybody have their book open? Name went right on my head. I apologize. Uh, Rutherford. Rutherford became president after Russell. Now, when Rutherford became president, Rutherford kind of tried to, to take over and take it in, in the direction, you know, that, I mean, as any kind of dictatorial leader would do, to make himself look good. And uh, so then there kind of came a little bit of a split. And you had the Russellites, and then Rutherford was the one that introduced the Jehovah's Witness name to the group. And... Uh, began, you know, continued in earnest. Um, worldwide, they're, they're several million strong, but actually in America, they're not all that strong. Um, there's, there's been several leaders, of course, down through the ages. That All of that history you can read in the book, and that, that doesn't really make a whole lot of difference to me. But the, the point is, what about their doctrine? What about how do we teach them? The basis of their doctrine winds up being that uh, they kind of accepted the, the idea that man is born into sin and uh, you know Christ came down to the earth, uh, died to save man from his sin, and, uh, but they, they do not accept the deity of Christ. They believe that there is one individual or entity within the Godhead. So they would, they would deny that there is a Godhead, uh, which the Bible very strongly teaches that there is a Godhead. <clears throat> and we'll go into a lot of scriptures uh, today. We're going to primarily stay in the Gospel of John this morning. And then uh, Thursday night, I plan on using uh, the Old Testament script Because uh, really, the, the whole question hinges on, is Jesus Christ God? Is He deity? Or was he just a created being? 
like an angel who came down to the earth. They maintain that he was Michael the archangel whom God created and God also created Lucifer who was the brother of Michael the archangel. Lucifer uh, went off into sin and became Satan and Michael became the savior of the world. So, interesting conclusion. And they also have some doctrines about the 144,000. They show that the 144,000 uh, or they say that the 144,000 are the ones that are going to go into heaven. But they also teach that we're like the animals. When we die, we're dead like Rover, dead all over. And the only existence that we have, and this is from my discussions with them, not from what's in the book, the only existence that we have after we die is in God's memory. And when, if we die in an unfaithful condition to God, God wipes us out of His memory. And that's what the Bible means when it talks about hell. There's not a, there's not a real place called hell. Uh, there's the, and, and the heaven is only an existence within God's memory. Um, then, aside from the 144,000 who are going to get to go to heaven, and this door has pretty much been shut by now, <clears throat> there are some of them that kind of get, kind of do a kind of a workaround to say that, well, there's a few that can still get into that number, uh, a few seats left in that auditorium, but, you know, but just very, very, very few. The rest of us, if we are faithful when we die, we will get to be reincarnated into existence from God's memory, okay? We don't have a soul. We don't have an eternal existence. We will get to come back to this earth and live forever on this earth in the Garden of Eden or the paradise that it was meant to be but that man messed up. I think that pretty much sums it up. Just, I mean, and here again, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's kind of a nutshell. Um, anybody have anything that you have run into to add to that? Sure. Well, like I say, if you're righteous and you're remembered by God, He will recreate this earth as the paradise it was meant to be and you'll get to live here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Big deal. Big deal, yeah. Yeah. It's not in many cases because they are they are steeped in it. There's no question about that. And it's just like talking to a Baptist or you know a, an atheist or anybody else. Pardon me. The Jehovah's Witness. Well, you know, Jehovah's Witness will discuss it with you, but they want to be in control of the conversation. They will a lot of times. Yeah, they. I have I had him not show up for about the third discussion with me one time, and I got a phone call from the young man that knocked on my door initially, and he told me that, you know, we're, we're there to teach. We're not there to be taught. I said, okay. I said, I'm there to learn and, and to teach. I said, uh, because I said, I'm open-minded. I'm willing to consider what you have to say. But if it's not in accordance with God's word, I'm not, you know, I'm going to talk to you about it. And they didn't like that. But, you know, you have to try because every now and then you're going to plant a seed. You're not going to convert. There may be the off chance that you will find one person in your life that you will convert in one sitting. With 99.99% of the people in this world, conversion is a process. You plant a seed here. It may be 10 years later that they something happens in their life and that seed so-and-so said something to me and they get back to you or they find somebody else and they talk to them and sometimes it's a continuing Bible study I've known of Bible studies to go on for two and three years and finally end up in the conversion of the student but it was a process 
And that's what we've got to realize. Everybody, uh, it was a, described to me one time uh, by uh, John Clark at Florida College. He said, everybody has these strings that attach them to their belief system. And he was specifically talking about Catholicism at that time. And he says, what you have to do is you have to come in and you have to start cutting those strings one at a time. And he said, eventually you cut enough strings that they're converted, but they still have these strings that tie them back to that system because that's what they've been taught all their life. You've got to keep on cutting those strings after you convert them. In other words, they've got to grow. We can't expect somebody to be converted and walk in here and be like a Christian who's been a Christian 30 years. It just doesn't happen. They've got to learn. And so we've got to keep cutting those strings. And if we can do just maybe one string in a session, one small string in a session, it might lead to something bigger down the road. But, of course, if they walk out, they walk out. You can't do any more than that. Um, but one of their principal doctrines that they, they have is that Christ was not deity. He was just a man. And uh, as a matter of fact, the, the uh, Islam teaches the same thing. He was just a prophet of God, they teach. Now, Jehovah's Witness believe that he was an angel. And so they will uh, translate in their Bible in several places. They have taken the idea that Jesus was God out and inserted A in front of it because they say the indefinite article the is not in the Greek text therefore he is not God he is God with a little g and so looking at their text of the Bible and I know most of you can't read this and I apologize for that but but I'll read it to you this morning I wanted to show you we're going to use their Bible this morning so keep your Bibles closed because all the passages we're going to consider I'm going to show on the board in their Bible, and I think some of the rest of them you'll be able to read, but John 1 was too lengthy to put into a PowerPoint slide. But they translate this. In the beginning was the Word. Word has a capital W in front of it. And the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. I'm going to soften the little g, God. This one was in the beginning with God. All things came into existence through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. This God created all things in the world, and not one thing came into existence without this God. Does that make sense? All right, if he was an angel, then he certainly was a creating angel. Because everything that was created came into being through this angel. But here's an inconsistency in verse, in just these first uh, three verses, and that is the Word, with a capital W, was a God. With a small g. Now, if He was the Word, He'd have to be God. Indefinite article, the, is not in there, so he's a God, they say. Now, the problem with that is, the word was with God, capital G, the indefinite article is not in front of their capital G, God. In verse 3, uh, excuse me, verse 2, the one, this one was in the beginning with God, no indefinite article in front of God there either. Why isn't that translated with a small g? Well, that's obviously talking about God the Father. The real God, the true God, the only God. But the indefinite article is not there either. There are some eight times that the word God appears in the first 18 verses of John chapter 1. And the only time they translate it with a little g is when it's referring to Jesus who is the Word... And they say that's because the indefinite article is not there, but the indefinite article isn't anywhere in that whole scripture. And you can look in their own Greek-English interlinear Bible, and it says the same thing. So, you know, we're going to use their literature here. Verse 4, What has come into existence by means of him was life, and the life was the light of men. What has come into existence by means of him with a little h 
Jesus, talking about this little God, was life. And the life was the light of men. Who can give life? God. Plainly taught in Scripture. The only one that can give life is God. But yet this a God gave life. And the light is shining in the darkness, but the darkness has not overpowered it. There came a man who was sent as a representative of God. His name was John. This man came as a witness in order to bear witness about the light, so that people of all sorts might believe through him. No, excuse me. He was not that light, but he was meant to bear witness about that light. The true light, the true light that gives light to every sort of man was about to come into the world. The true light was about to come into the world. Huh. He was in the world, and the world came into existence through him, but the world did not know him. Again, little H's. Talking about Jesus Christ. The world came into existence through him and did not know him. He came to his own home, but his own people did not accept him. However, to all who did receive him, again, little h, he gave authority to become God's children because they were exercising faith in his name. And they were born not from blood or from a fleshly will, from man's will, but from God. If he is the one who made them children of God... And they came from God, and they translate that last word God in verse 13, but from God, with a capital G again, but that's referring to Jesus Christ. (laughs) Inconsistencies all over the place. So the Word became flesh. They capitalize Word again. He became flesh and resided among us, and we had a view of His glory, a glory such as belongs to an only begotten from a Father. And He was full of divine favor and truth. John bore witness about Him. Yes, he cried out, This is the one of whom I said, the one coming from behind me, has advanced in front of me, for He existed before me. Now wait a minute, who was born first, John or Jesus? John was born first. Jesus was born later, but Jesus existed before John? Hmm. For all, we all receive from his fullness even undeserved kindness and undeserved, upon undeserved kindness as grace upon grace. Because the law was given through Moses, the undeserved kindness or the grace, and the truth came to be. What does came to be mean? It came into existence through Jesus Christ. Christ. If truth came to be in existence through Jesus Christ, and truth is God, what is Jesus Christ? No man has seen God at any time. This one really this one really is is a kicker. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, little g, who is at the Father's side is the one who has explained him. Hmm. That one really kicks it, doesn't it? That last statement. Nobody's seen God, but Jesus has shown us God. So what does that make him? They have tried their best to sanitize this passage of Scripture, but they just can't do it and keep it anywhere close to what it says in the Greek. And they have to admit that. Uh, and that's, that's why they've translated this the way they have. They've tried to twist some words and add some little things in there. But, you know, if you tell them, oh, but, you know, the, the New American Standard says it different, oh, well, that's, that's not a good translation. None of the other translations that have ever been done are good translations. Now, Wayne loves it when they start talking to him about the Greek, because Wayne will pull out his Greek New Testament, hand it to him, say, would you read that to me? <laughs> And so Wayne will turn in it and he'll read it to him in the Greek, translate it for him. And, you know, because he can read Greek. I, I wish I could. That would be fun. But uh, that backs him up every time. But uh, they don't know the Greek. And here's another thing. We don't know who the translators were of this New World Translation. 
Now they will tell you that, oh, that, that attests to its accuracy because the people who translated it didn't even want to put their names on it. They were such humble men. A guy who does a work and refuses to put his... You know, have you ever read uh, a hit piece in the newspaper and the writer of it, you know, used to read in the newspaper letters to the editor? And the newspaper got to where if you didn't put your name on the article that you wrote, they wouldn't print it. Because people would write these uh, excoriating hit pieces on politicians or other people that they didn't like and they'd refuse to sign it. Anonymous. That's a sign of cowardice when you don't sign your work in every other thing except the translation of the New World Bible. <laughs> um, let's look at what the New World Translation oops, wrong thing, excuse me. The New World Translation says <clears throat> about Jesus. There are some I believe it's Six, uh, 14 or 15 statements about Jesus that I call the I am's of John. Now, a lot of men have said there are seven. Well, I'm going to say that, yeah, there are seven major I am's of John. The others, you might call them minor I am's. But every one of these is a piece of the puzzle. Now, when Jesus said to Pilate, Pilate said, are you then a king? And Jesus said, you have rightly said I am a king. That's not a deal breaker by itself. What it is, it's a small piece of the entire puzzle that when taken with every other statement of Jesus in John in the context of the whole book, it becomes a deal breaker. And so we need to look at all of these statements together and uh, we're going to look at it, as I said, in their Bible. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Is that big enough for at least some of you to be able to read? <laughs> I know some of you can't, but we'll try it. In John chapter 6 and verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not get hungry at all, and whoever exercises faith in me will never get thirsty at all. I don't think we need to read that in the in our you know in an accurate Bible. I'm, I'm going to say in an accurate Bible, King James, New King James. Any of those are, are excellent translations. Not a problem with any of them. Um, but you know theirs is is translated to try to sanitize out the idea that Jesus is deity, except that Jesus said, "I am the bread of life," and their Bible admits that He said that. In verse 51 of chapter 6 of John, he said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And for a fact, the bread that I will give is my flesh in behalf of the life of the world. I am the living bread. Kind of describes deity, doesn't it? He said, I am the true light. Then Jesus spoke again to them in John 8 and verse 12. John 8 verse 12. Then Jesus spoke again to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will by no means walk in darkness, but will possess the light of life. In chapter 9 and verse 5 it says, As long as I am in the world, I am the world's light. Where does light come from? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. God said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. Jesus said, I am he who can testify. Now the Jews were, in the, in the context of this, the Jews were denying the deity of Christ. They were denying that he was sent from God. They were saying that he was an unjust teacher and an unrighteous teacher. And Jesus answers them in John chapter 8, beginning in verses 17 down through verse 19. Also in your own law it is written, the witness of two men is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Then they said to him, where is your Father? Oh, this is wonderful. Jesus answered, you know neither me or my Father. If you did know me, you would know my Father also. What is that saying? I and the Father are one. If you know me, you'll know the Father. 
And after that, they sought to kill him. Why would they seek to kill him? Because of his blasphemy, making himself equal with God. Why did he say that if it wasn't true? Again, this is in their own Bible. Jesus said, I am from above. In John chapter 8 and verse 23, he went on to say to them, You are from the realms below, I am from the realms above. You are from this world, I am not of this world. Now, taken you know, by itself, one piece of the puzzle, out of, out of the whole puzzle, this could be saying he's saying I am an angel. I admit that. So like I said, every piece of this is not a deal breaker. But when you put all of these pieces of the puzzle together in the context of the Gospel of John, everything it says, then it becomes a deal breaker. And that's where we got to go with this. And, and what we need to do with them is we need to get enough time from them, uninterrupted, that we can present material like this to them. And, you know, what you might want to do is say, look, I'll tell you what, we'll do this study. I'm going to give you 15 minutes to start. And I will not interrupt you during that time. I will simply take notes. And then I want you to give me 15 minutes. Uninterrupted time. Don't get up and walk out. Listen to everything I have to say. Then you can begin to present this material. And say, you know, here it is. This one, he claimed to be God. In chapter 13 and verse 19, from this moment on, I am now telling you before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am He. The He is not really in the Greek text. Not in their Greek text either. Uh, But you will believe that I am. But you can throw the He in there, I don't care. Jesus is saying, I am He. I am God. In chapter 8 and verse 58, Jesus said to them, Most truly I say to you, before Abraham came into existence, I have been. That term is a term for eternal existence. Throughout the Old Testament, it's used in that way to to indicate eternal existence. In the New Testament, it is consistently used that way to indicate eternal eternal existence. Before Abraham was, I have been. In chapter 10 and verses 7 through 9, I am the door. So Jesus said again, most truly I say to you, I am the door for the sheep. All those who have come in place of me are thieves and robbers and plunders, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the door, whoever enters through me will be saved, and that one will go in and out and find pasturage. Now, Jesus is referring here to the fact that before he came on the scene of this earth, there were some 50 or so men who came claiming to be the Messiah who would deliver the Jews from the Roman oppression. And all 50 of them had come to naught. And Jesus now comes into the earth, claims to be the Messiah, who's going to save the world from sin. A little bit different message. Well, the Jewish leaders didn't like that because they wanted to be saved from Roman oppression. They kind of had their sights set down here. Jesus had his sights set way up here. you know. Um, but Jesus said, everybody who's come before me is a thief or a robber. I came to save the sheep. And if the sheep want to be saved, they've got to come to salvation through me. Who is it that can forgive sins? The Jews knew this. Who? God. Anybody else? Catholics say the priests can, but they're wrong. And you can say that, and the Jehovah's Witness would agree to you, would agree with you instantly. Um, only God can forgive sin. Jesus said, "You've got to come to salvation through me. I am the door." He said, "I am the good shepherd." In chapter ten beginning in verse 11 down through verse 15. I am the fine shepherd. Now they take good shepherd and make it fine shepherd. That's okay. The fine shepherd surrenders his life in behalf of the sheep. The hired man who is not a shepherd and to whom the sheep do not belong see the wolf coming and abandons the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He who is a hired man and does not care for the sheep 
I am the fine shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I surrender my life on behalf of the sheep. He's a good shepherd. He is the one who cares about the sheep because the sheep belong to Him. That's an indication of deity. This one got him in a lot of trouble with the Jews. He claimed to be the Son of God. In chapter 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. Then we're going to skip down to verse 36 through 39. Do you say to me whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you you blaspheme because I said I am God's Son? If I am not doing the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I am doing them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may come to know and may continue knowing that the Father is in union with me and I am in union with the Father. So they tried again to seize him, but he escaped from their reach. Now, they try to sanitize this by putting the words in union rather than I and the Father are one in union with is the way they say it. The Jews didn't understand it that way. The Jews understood that he was making himself equal to the Father. And they tried to seize him for it. That's what claiming to be the Son of God meant to the Jewish mind. Now, if Jesus didn't mean that, why didn't Jesus say, Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You misunderstood me. I'm a created being. I'm an angel. I'm not equal to God. But he didn't do that. He doubled down, as it were, on saying, I am equal to the Father. And the Jews understood that to mean what it meant. And they sought to kill him all the more. This one is, I think, extremely important. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. On two two fronts, actually, because... Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses are like the Sadducees they do not believe in the resurrection but secondly because if Jesus is the resurrection he has to be deity Jesus said to her chapter 11 verse 25 down through 27 Jesus said to her and this is talking to Martha I am the resurrection and the life the one who exercises faith in me even though he dies will come to life you don't believe in the resurrection? You believe when we die, we're dead like Rover, we're dead all over? This says we're going to come back to life. And everyone who is living and exercises faith in me will never die at all. Wait a minute. If they're never going to die at all, that means we all have an eternal existence. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. You are the Christ, the Son of God. The Jews understood that term Son of God to mean that he was equal to God, that he was deity. And just in our previous reading, they tried to stone him for making that claim. Jesus said that he is the master or the teacher and the Lord. In chapter 13 and verse 13, you address me as teacher and Lord and you are correct, for I am such. The word there, rabbi or rabboni, whichever way it's it's, uh, put into the text, literally means master. Uh, They looked upon their teachers as, uh, they looked upon their rabbis as masters and teachers. So it could be translated either way. But they looked upon them as one having authority. Um, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In chapter 14, beginning in verse 6. Again, this is their translation. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you men had known me, you would have known my Father also. From from this moment on, you know him and have seen him. Ooh, wait a minute, Jesus. If you're just an angel, you're making an awful big statement there. If you see me, you've seen the Father, and you're just Michael the archangel? 
That's rather arrogant, isn't it? Philip said to him, you know, here's Philip, he didn't... We, you know, I'm going to throw this in again, this is extra. Thomas gets a bad rap, and he doesn't deserve the bad rap he gets is doubting Thomas. He really doesn't. Look at what Jesus said. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Philip immediately says, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Philip didn't get it. When Jesus said it plain as day, Philip still didn't get it. Jesus said to him, Even after I have been with you men for such a long time, Philip, have you not come to know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father also. How is it you say, show us the Father? They didn't even try to sanitize this passage of Scripture. Must have missed this one. Because I can't believe they didn't try to change that one. That's just as plain as day. Pick, Grab their own Bible and turn to this passage and show it to them. Jesus is the Father. The Father is Jesus. They're one and the same. If you've seen one, you've seen the other, he says. If he's not deity, why did he say this? I am the true vine. Chapter 15, beginning in verse... uh, Let's see. Hmm, this didn't come out right. I think we're beginning in verse 1. I put 15, but... I am the true vine, and my Father is a cultivator. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and He cleans every one bearing fruit, so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in union with me, and I will remain in union with you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, neither can you unless you remain in union with me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever remains in union with me and I in union with him, this one bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing at all. If anyone does not remain in union with me, he is thrown out like a branch and dries up. And men gather those branches and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in union with me and my sayings remain in you, ask whatever you wish, it will take place for you. Jesus said that he is not of this world. He's talking about his disciples here. He says they are not a part of this world just as I am no part of this world. So Jesus is indicating there that he's a heavenly being. Now here again, not a deal breaker by itself. But when taken in context of all the rest of those statements, it puts another piece in that puzzle. And finally... In chapter 18 and verse 36, Jesus answered Pilate, My kingdom is not part of this world. If my kingdom were part of this world, my attendants would have thought that I should not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from this source. My kingdom is not of this world. And God is going to create a kingdom on this world that all of His righteous live in. But Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. How do you reconcile those two statements? You can't. It's not possible. So Pilate said to him, Well then, are you a king? And Jesus answered, You yourself are saying that I am a king. In other words, yeah. You said it. You're right. I am a king. You yourself are saying that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is on the side of the truth listens to my voice again not a deal breaker but a piece of the puzzle that took about 30 minutes for me to go through that (laughs) uh, with my comments so you might not get through all of that together uh, in 15 minutes but these are just some things that we can present to them and say look Here's what God John says about Jesus Christ, and it's in your own translation of the Bible. It's always nice when you can take, when you're studying with a Catholic and you take the Catholic Bible that they recognize as being the right one and you teach them from it. Because they can't argue with, well, oh, well, that's your, just, your, your version of the Bible, your translation. And if you use their translation of the Bible and you show them where it even teaches the truth, 
they can't argue with that and say, oh, well, that's just your translation. Because it's their translation. It kind of reminds me of the story about the man who was, uh, and I cannot remember the entire essay, but he said it was evening, uh, evening time and he was passing by the blacksmith's shop and he heard the blacksmith's hammer ringing the vesper chime. You know, he was pounding something out on his anvil. And he walked into the blacksmith's shop and he saw him beating on an anvil and he looked over in a corner and there were a bunch of broken hammers over there. And he asked the blacksmith, he said, how many anvils have you worn out to tear up so many hammers? And the blacksmith said, oh, this is my original anvil. You see, the hammers tear themselves up on the anvil, but they do not destroy the anvil. And he said, God's word is like that anvil. The skeptics have beat upon it for centuries trying to destroy it, but the skeptics have all gone away. And the Word of God stands as that anvil does, unscathed, undented, unchallenged is the truth. I think we're out of time. Anybody got any questions before we close? Thank you.